Welcome back to another episode of the Hard Money Talks podcast. Today, I'm joined by my friend, Melanie Locker, who runs the website Dear Debt. And today we're going to be talking about an important topic about mental health, suicide, and debt. A lot of people find that suicide is the only option when they're looking at debt. And you know what? The show Squid Games came out last year where it highlighted a lot of mental health and debt awareness. And so I brought my friend Melanie on the show today to talk about her experience with mental health and debt. And also she does so much great work around suicide awareness and debt. And so I wanted to bring her on the show because this is a hard money talk. A lot of people have committed suicide due to their debt. And I'm going to share with you my brother's suicide story, and she's going to share with you some suicide in her family. And we're just going to have a hard money talk about suicide and how you can have hope and find hope in the midst of deep debt and depression. You're not going to want to miss this show. Let's go and talk with Melanie. All right. Thanks, Melanie, for being on the show today. I'm glad to have you here. We were talking just briefly before, you know, we hit the record button about all that you do. And we've known each other for years. Um, And I don't know, we were just talking kind of about suicide and debt and your website and your debt. So let's just kind of start from the beginning. Like, so you were in debt, like I was in debt. And so how, how did you get into debt? And Let's kind of start from the beginning there. And, uh, you know, this is, I'm drinking coffee on this one. <laughs> We're just going to get real comfortable with this one because this is a yes. tough topic. This is a lot of <laughs> dark, heavy topics. Mm-hmm. So brace yourselves, folks. We're diving right We're in. We're diving yes. into suicide, depression, <laughs> mental health today. Yep. All of that stuff. Yeah. But I borrowed $81,000 in student loans to go to um, Cal State University of Long Beach, as well as my dream school of New York University. So I went to school at two different times. I took out 23,000 for my undergrad degree in theater and then 58,000 for my master's degree from NYU in performance studies. And, you know, I graduated with my bachelor's kind of not really thinking about student loan debt, not thinking about its impact and just treated it like a bill. And then, you know, I was in the workforce for three years working full time. I had enough money in savings that I could pay off my debt. But then I decided to go get my master's degree in New York. And it was one of those situations where I knew that I could check that off the bucket list of getting my master's at NYU, going to my dream school, living in New York. It was like, check, check, check all these boxes. But then I knew that I was going to be tripling my debt load. What was, what did you want to be? Like, what was your goal career for doing all of these degrees? Yeah. So this is actually really important to the story and something that I actually don't mention enough. So I originally wanted to get my master's degree so that I could get a PhD and become a professor. And about halfway through my program, I realized that academia was not for me and that it was just not based in the real world. And I had come from the nonprofit world where I felt like I was actually making a difference in people's lives, that I was serving the community on the ground. And as much as I loved kind of swirling in the intellectualism of grad school, I was like, I don't know how this is going to change anyone's life. Like, and I'm paying all this money to be here just to have fun talking about ideas, but I don't know if this is actually going to change anyone's life. And Now I've adversely affected my life because I'm in so much debt. And so, you know, that is an important part of the story that I don't mention as often, but it's really important that I had a goal of being a professor and getting a PhD. And so in my mind, it was one step before this next step, before this next step. And then halfway along the way, it's like, oh gosh, I don't see myself in academia. And so I thought, well, I could still work in arts education like I was before. I could work in program management. I was aiming to like make like $50,000. Like before that, I was making $38,000. And I was like, if I could just make $50,000, I'll be great. (laughs) And I graduated NYU in uh, May 2011. And I was teaching theater in Harlem and working part-time jobs. And I went on like 30 interviews for full-time nonprofit jobs. And I was getting so close, like interview two, three, four, and it was always down to me and somebody else. And they would go with someone else. Mm. 
And about six months of interviews, I was like, I feel like I'm just not meant to be in New York. I feel like I can't afford to live here. My student loans are becoming due. And so then I moved to Portland, Oregon, which my then partner was there at the time. And I was like, well, we'll be together. I'll lower my cost of living. I'll be a big fish in a small pond and it'll be great. Not exactly how it worked out. So I moved to Portland, Oregon and Portland is a smaller place. So they also have a smaller economy. And, you know, LA and New York have a vibrant arts culture, but Portland did not insofar in the sense that it had paid work. <laughs> and so I found like 10 to $12 an hour jobs. I was on food stamps briefly and, you know, all of 2012, I just realized, you know, I had this specific dream. I told myself that getting into debt would be worth it, but then the dream changed and now my life has changed. And now I have all of this debt that I can't pay back because I'm making 10 to $12 an hour and I'm on food stamps. And I was just so depressed. Like I've dealt with clinical depression and anxiety. So I, I have that as like a mental health filter, but this was definitely situational. Like it was because of my debt. It was because I hate the feeling that I owe someone money. I hate the feeling that I owe someone in general. And then, you know, all the feelings of shame for going to this fancy private school, guilt for getting an arts degree, you mm -hmm. know, all of these feelings just Kind of, and also the isolation, because, you know, I would ask my friends, like, what did you do? Did you pay for, for grad school? Did you take out a bunch of student loans? And either people were like, my parents paid for it, so I don't have debt, which is like, that's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they had debt, but they didn't care about it. And I was like, I wish I was the type of person that didn't, that didn't care, care about my debt, but I'm not. And, you know, something that I've realized recently is that I just don't have the risk tolerance for debt. You know, we talk about risk tolerance as it relates to investing a lot, but I think it's really important that we understand our risk tolerance as it relates to debt, because I'm the type of person that I am super risk averse when it comes to debt. I, I just don't like it. It makes me physically ill and anxious and pretty much a year of just crying every day, wondering, what am I going to do with my life? How am I ever going to pay this back? That's when I started my blog, Dear Debt, January 3rd, 2013, because I was like, if I can spend just a little bit of this energy that I spend crying and being upset and anxious on trying to pay off my debt, on creating a creative outlet for me to deal with these emotions, maybe I have a chance. And so at that time, I think I had $57,000 left. I had used some of my savings to pay off debt and to survive. And I said, I'm going to pay off this debt in four years. And I was like, I'm making $12 an hour right now. I have no idea how this is going to be possible, but I'm just putting it out there in the universe that I'm going to pay this off. And so many wild things happened for me to get to that point where I actually did. I paid it off in December, 2015. And my blog completely changed my life and helped me create a creative outlet for me to deal with these emotions and connect with people like you. That's awesome. You know, I think back to like, I think a lot of us started our, our blogs, websites to help other people, but also as accountability. Cause I started mine in 2009 to get out of debt, but a lot of it was because a lot of people were wondering like, how was I saving so much money on groceries? And back when I started it, you know, it was called I am that lady. And it, it focused more on like couponing and deals and stuff like that. And now, and then I rebranded it in, I think in 2014 to laurengroupman.com to focus more on the budgeting and debt reduction piece. But, um, a lot of us started with that mindset of like, how can I pass on, you know, I'm trying, how can I refocus our, my, my stuff. And, and my blog was a big reason how I paid off my debt so quickly too, because it can bring in additional income as well, you know? Um, so I think you said an important thing that you like put it out there. Like you almost like a man, if you like manifested, like, I'm going to pay this off in four years. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I'm making a minimum wage. And instead of just like sitting on your butt and crying all the time. So you have $57,000 in student loan debt. Was that like, what was the percentage rate? Was it growing? Like what, what kind of interest are we looking at? Yeah. So my undergraduate loans were at 2.3%, which wasn't that bad, but my graduate loans, which was like 50 K plus was at 7.9 and 6.8%. And so I had calculated 
the interest. And at one point I was paying $11 per day in interest because the thing with student loans, student loan debt interest accrues daily. And I didn't realize that. And when I did the math, I felt sick to my stomach. I was like, $11 a day, that's like 300 plus a month. And I was like, I could fly from New York to LA like once a month <laughs> with how much I'm paying in interest and just realizing all of the things that I could do with $300 a month really lit a fire under me. It made me angry. And I tell people if they have that anger and they have the capability of using it as fuel to do so, because obviously I could have let the anger eat me alive and stew, but I was like, no, I'm so mad. I'm going to use this to fuel my repayment and be done with this because I don't want to make my student loan servicer richer. I don't want to make anyone profit off of my debt. I want this gone yesterday. And so just being more aware of how much interest was accruing, um, what I could be paying for all of that really just reframed my whole outlook on debt and repayment so that I wanted to just get it done as soon as possible. I love that to use the anger. But another thing that you mentioned that I just want to point out too, is you mentioned like, cause you didn't actually finish the PhD process and things. So I know that there's people out there listening or watching that might be in the same boat. Like you went to go get a degree and then you dropped out or something happened and you never finished your degree. So now not only are you stuck not having a degree, but now you have a ton of student loans and no degree. So you could just, you know, forgive my French, but you could just live, you know, beat the shit out of yourself all the time for having no degree and a ton of student loans. I mean, at least if you have student loans and a degree, you feel like, okay, at least it was worth it. Right. So you might, I mean, the mental health piece, I know for me, cause I have diagnosed depression and anxiety as well. And I'm on medication for it. That if I don't take care of that habitual, like when you have anxiety, like the habitual, like beating yourself up thing that if you don't take care of that, like, I'm sure that could have done a number on you just by itself. Yeah. I will say, you know, I made a conscious choice to at least get my master's degree. So I do have, you know, the master's, but Obviously, like you mentioned, like the whole plan of getting into that much debt was to get a PhD. So it was kind of like, oh God, like at least I have a master's, but then also this isn't what I really wanted. Like I wanted the PhD, I wanted the being a professor and that didn't happen. And so there was a long period of time that I was stuck in that vicious cycle of beating myself up because the thing is, is I had a great full-time job. Granted, it was only making 38,000, but it was in arts management with nonprofits and working with children. And so I loved it. And, you know, I kept thinking I left this job to go pursue this dream. And then now the dream changed. And for so long, I was stuck in this negative loop of, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I made Mm. the biggest mistake of my life. And that took me a lot of therapy and a lot of reframing. And then also the blog to change my identity around that decision, because for over a year plus after graduating, I just kept thinking I made the biggest mistake of my life, quitting that job. And then, you know, not even going to get a PhD and being a professor. And even though it sounds like, oh, I should be able to get more job opportunities with a master's degree, not necessarily because people think you're overqualified. Mm, Yep. And so then they're like, oh, I don't know if I want to give you a chance because you're overqualified and, or I don't know if I can pay you enough. And so it led to all these other different circumstances where I was like, I don't know if this benefited me at all. At all. Right. (laughs) Okay. So now, so now you start the blog and the yeah. purpose of the blog, like, are you writing dear debt? So are you writing yeah. letters to your debt or what, what is the, you know, yeah. purpose behind it? the premise of the blog, dear debt is kind of based on the dear John concept. So, you know, writing breakup letters to debt. So I would write these breakup letters to debt saying, dear debt, I'm so over you. We are finally done. You know, I'm over you. And so I would write breakup letters to debt. Every single month, I would talk about my debt repayment update. So how much I paid off that month. I would also share my side hustle adventures. I was doing lots of wild side hustles at the time, like being a brand ambassador, pet sitter, mover. Uh, I sold water bottles at a rave once. 
um, like lots of wild. Hey, things. we got to talk about that. What <laughs> yeah. was that like? Was that crazy? <laughs> it was wild because I just answered this Craigslist ad that was like, Hey, come sell water bottles at this warehouse. And you see these sweaty people that are probably intoxicated that will pay they were more $5 than it, they were more than intoxicated for water. <laughs> and you're just like, here you go. Here you go. And I worked like 10 PM to 6 AM. And I left with a bunch of cash the next morning. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to mess up my sleep schedule, but it was worth it to make that money. <laughs> when you're in, when you're in that, and I teach so many side hustles, like in my courses and community and stuff like that. Like when you're in that side hustle mentality, it's just like, whatever. Like I, I remember I ate Chinese food at like a market research company and they pay me like a hundred bucks. And I just thought like, this is groceries for two weeks for us. Like I, you know what I mean? and, and I did like some of the silliest things like for 50 bucks, because I just, whatever money that I didn't have to take out of the money that I was using to pay down debt, like I would just do whatever, you know, I could. So exactly. Yeah. And one of my greatest side hustles was being an event assistant at a Jewish congregation and I'm not Jewish. And that's why they hired me. Cause they were like, Oh, great. You can work our holidays and it won't be a conflict of interest. And I was like, perfect. Great. I'll work your holidays. And there was always so much leftover food. And so I would make money and then also have food for the week. And that also helped my groceries too. And I did so many different random side hustles. And like, I always joke that I did pretty much anything that was legal and people would pay me to do. <laughs> and, you know, you get into that mindset where you're just like, I just want to earn more so that I can pay off this debt. And, you know, the blog, you know, I was writing these debt letters. I was writing updates every month on my debt repayment progress, as well as how much I was paying off and my side hustles. And then I would invite other people to write dear debt letters as well, which that really made it like a community project. So other people would write dear debt letters as well. And that was really a beautiful experiment because obviously we had some letters that were funny, were humorous, some were incredibly heartbreaking and really shifted the way I saw debt. Like I always had a very adversarial relationship to debt and I thought it was evil. I thought it was like an ex that tortured me. And I always thought of it that way. So my letters always kind of reflected that. And I remember receiving one dear debt letter that was like, dear debt, thank you so much for helping me pay the bills so I could avoid homelessness. Mm. Dear debt, thank you so much for feeding me so I wouldn't go hungry. And I wow. was just heartbroken and really just reframed my thinking of debt and thinking like we judge people for being in debt so often, but then it can help people avoid homelessness and hunger. And that was a very real letter. And so, you know, the blog really helped open up my eyes and just create this community of debt fighters who were paying off debt alongside with me and encouraging me. And through the blog, I realized a bunch of other people were leveraging their blog into freelance writing opportunities. And I thought, well, I have a master's degree that I paid a lot of money for that. I wrote a lot, you know, for that degree. I now blog. I wonder if I could do this because like I said, I was doing these random side hustles of being a brand ambassador, being a pet sitter, a mover, event assistant. And I was like, it'd be nice to just stay home and work on my computer and not be here, there and everywhere. I wonder if I could do that. And so I started pitching myself to other bloggers. I started pitching myself to financial sites and I got my first writing gig. And to make a long story short, within a year and a half of the blog, I became a full-time self-employed freelance writer. And you know, I eventually found this nonprofit job making 31,000 after two years of graduation. And I quit that after one year to become a full-time self-employed writer. And my parents were like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you just finally found a job with benefits. You've been crying for two years. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm making the same amount of money on the side with writing as I am at my nonprofit job. I really think if I free up eight hours a day, I can double my income. And sure enough, I was able to double my income that first year of self-employment from 30,000 to 60,000. My rent in Portland in a shared studio was $400. And I kept that cost of living pretty much the whole time. And so doubling your income from 30,000 to 60,000, when your rent is $400 and you don't have a car, you don't really go out, you get food from your event assistant job. <laughs> you know, I just like 
paid off my debt. And so those were the things that happened that really expedited the timeline. Like I said, when I started my blog, I was making $12 an hour and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay off $57,000 in four years. I just know that's my wild audacious goal that I don't know how it's going to happen. And like I said, slowly, but surely these things happened where I was like, wait, people are making money from their blog. People are leveraging their blog to become writers. Oh, I can actually do that. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that for seven plus years now and obviously have made more money than 60 grand since then. And, (laughs) you know, paid off my debt in December, 2015. And I'm a full-time freelance writer and blogger and entrepreneur. And I love to inspire other people to pay off debt because I just know how much it affected my life and my mental health. And I just knew deep down that I wouldn't be content until that was gone. Mm -hmm. And so I told myself, I'm not getting back into debt. I'm going to make sure that I'm financially successful, that I can save, that I can invest, that I can move on with my life. And yeah, here we are. And I think that the story of so many of us who are entrepreneurs in the online financial space, not just in the financial space, but online, so many people don't realize how many side hustle ideas and ways to make money there are online. You know what I mean? And, and how amazing it is for my mental health. When I went through my divorce, you know, I took a couple of years off of working completely to take care of my own mental health and take care of my kids and make sure they were stable. And, you know, I was stable And my website still supported me financially a hundred percent without me even having to work. And that's the beauty of building online businesses, you know? So let's go back. You said, you know, we were talking about mental health and I know that one of the big things that you stand for and that you, you know, found and wrote about on your blog was suicide prevention. So talk about how you got into that with your blog. Cause I want to, I want people to understand that. Yeah. So, you know, obviously that first year of the blog, like I think it's important to note that the first year I was completely anonymous because I was also trying to find a job that would pay me a living wage. And so I was like, well, I don't really want to put my face out there because I'm looking for a job. So I was completely anonymous that first year. And so while I was anonymous, I was honest about my mental health struggles. I was honest that my debt made me severely depressed and anxious. And so many people had said me too. And it was one of those things where I thought I was so alone thinking I'm the only person that had felt so depressed about my student loan debt. And then here I found a community of people saying, oh my gosh, I feel the same way. And so that's the beauty of speaking up about your own experiences is that you're never alone. We just, we don't talk about it. And so people think they're alone, but then as soon as you're brave enough to open up, your community just finds you. And so that's what happened. And then I remember about at the year mark of blogging, I was looking through my WordPress stats and, Oh, I got a new hit. What are the search terms? People are finding me. And I saw one of the search terms was, um, I want to kill myself because of debt. And I was just stuck staring at that thinking, Oh my gosh, someone Googled, I want to kill myself because of debt and found my blog. And so I wrote this post as if I was writing to this person, like, I don't know who this person is. Obviously I can't reach you, but I want to let you know that debt is not a death sentence, that it is never worth dying over. Your life is so precious. And this is a temporary problem with a permanent solution. And so because we're bloggers creating content, of course, if you write about a topic, then the more people that search for that topic will find you more. So sadly, that became one of my top searched blog posts. And so it was one of these things where to this day, that's one of my top search terms that people find in my blog is I want to kill myself because of debt. And so I think it must have been year two that I um, created the suicide prevention awareness blog tour. So I got a bunch of my personal finance blogger friends together during September, which is suicide prevention awareness month. And I said, let's write about this very taboo topic. A lot of people talk about finance and debt, but people aren't really connecting that it can lead to debt. It can lead to depression. It could even lead to suicide. Mm -hmm. And I did that for about five or six years. And I also won the Plutus award for community service a couple of years ago for that project, which was lovely. And it really highlighted to me that 
so many people came out of the woodwork to say, I have a friend that has been in that situation or I lost, you know, my sibling to that, or my dad, you know, dealt with this and people would just share their stories. And it's like, we need to highlight these very taboo topics because people are feeling so alone and so ashamed and they're leading themselves to that dark path because they feel like no one else is on that path with them. Mm -hmm. And so it was so beautiful to have all these blog posts around this time to share with people that there are options to get out of debt, that it's not worth it, that they're not alone. And so I always say, you know, debt is not a death sentence. And I also say, you are not alone. You are not alone. And I think that's really important for people to realize because people tend to think that, you know, I'm in so much debt. And so I'm worthless. Mm. What I hear a lot is I'm worth more dead than alive because of their life insurance policy or like whatever. And it's just like so heartbreaking that these people have gotten to this point. And I just want to be a resource for people because it is a very taboo topic and no one really talks about it. And so I wanted to be a trailblazer to say this is happening and we need to address it. That's really the the basis and the reason why I'm doing this show is because I've been teaching financial education for a decade. And about a year ago, I was like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm sick of talking about it. I'm sick of talking about budgeting. I want to talk about the real stuff. Like I want to talk about these kind of topics because this is what's really going on behind closed doors. And people aren't talking about this kind of stuff, you know, mental health, financial abuse, you know, suicide, uh, you know, and, and, and the, the, t- the lists go on and on and on gambling, sex addictions, like all of these things that are going on behind closed doors. Let's talk about those things so that we can free up that and actually succeed with our money. And you said something really profound that this is a temporary problem with a permanent solution. That's huge because in the mind of somebody who's in debt, they see it as a permanent problem, like that there's no hope. It's like you're going down a dark hallway and there's no window, no exit. There's no hope. And when you, when you're in that depressive state, cause I remember when I was in debt before we made the decision to like get, get out, it can, it can feel like everything's closing in on you and that there's no hope. And I've, I've had people come to me like that as well. You know, how I can't even pay my bills now. How am I going to pay off the debt? And that's where you have to be willing to do a side hustle. You have to be willing to do that. But if you have mental health issues on top of that, pulling yourself up out of bed every night to go and do a side hustle or in the morning to do a different job can be really challenging, you know, when you're already in that bad frame of mind. It's so important that we talk about these issues because they're so bi directional mental health and finances, you know your financial state can affect your mental health and also your mental health state can affect your finances. And, you know, I talk a lot about these issues on my new podcast, the mental health and wealth show, similar to you. Like I want to talk about these hard issues because they're so interconnected. And I want to look at every single crevice of how they intersect because yeah, these are the real issues that people aren't talking about. And I think it's so important that we bring awareness and also hope to people who are struggling and also some compassion and self-love because we feel so trapped in that situation. And, you know, as I was mentioning to you kind of before we hit record is that, you know, suicide is also something that's very pertinent to me and my life because my grandfather died by suicide when my mom was five and my grandma was left to raise six kids alone. And, you know, though we will never know the real cause, there was some guesses that it might have been finance related. And um, I've dealt with my own suicidal ideation as a teenager. And, you know, while I wasn't quite there with my debt repayment, it did make me very depressed. And I've, I've felt that way before where you feel like I don't have hope to go on and I don't know how I can keep living. And that is an extremely dark place to be. And I think for people who haven't experienced suicidal ideation, it can be very scary. Mm -hmm. It can be very threatening. It can be overwhelming. I mean, even as someone who's dealt with that, I know it can be overwhelming too. And I've dealt with that. Um, And yeah, I think it's really hard and people want to tiptoe around the topics and pretend 
it doesn't exist or I'm not qualified to talk about that. And I think we really need to have real people talking about these issues because if we just wait for the professionals or the experts to talk about it, then no one's gonna talk about it. And I often feel like people relate more to quote real people right. who've been through these types of things. I always participate in any suicide awareness kind of stuff. Cause my brother, um, I've talked about him a couple of times on the show in previous episodes, but he actually committed suicide, uh, back so in sorry. 2000. Thank you. Yeah. 2000. Let me think 2015, no 2005, he committed suicide and he had had a history with drugs. Um, and he actually robbed a bank, took the money and went and bought himself lunch because he was homeless at the time. He went and bought himself food. And then he like waited to get arrested because he had no place to go. And then he was told them that he was suicidal and they didn't put him in suicide watch. Mm. And then he killed himself while he was in jail coming wow. down from a heroin binge. So he had attempted suicide many, many, many times in the past, but his ultimate um, thing was, was, was financial. He could never get ahead financially, number one, because he was a drug addict and he spent all of his money. But number two, when he did get money, it was like food or clothing and, and, and you can't get an apartment. You, ha you either have to, you can't get a job without an apartment and then you can't get an apartment without a job. And so it was this always this hard thing for him to get back on his feet. So suicide awareness for me is like such an important part of my life. And I think that from it, this topic, when it comes to suicide and mental health and finances is, is so important because you, like you said, we don't talk about it enough. So like if somebody were to be in a situation where they are feeling suicidal, my suggestion is always, you know, to tell somebody and go get help like right away. Um, you can have somebody do a welfare check. If you, if you know somebody who's suicidal, you can call the police and have them go do a welfare check on them, make sure they're not going to hurt themselves. So what are some things that like you've had to encounter? Cause, because obviously like if, if people are commenting on your website that they might be suicidal, like you, how do you handle that? I mean, yeah, so it, it's extremely difficult. So first of all, so many people that I respond to on my blog, they write me as if I'm just some anonymous stranger. They tell me their deep, dark secrets and you can tell that it's a cry for help. And so I respond to every single one. And first of all, it's interesting because more often than not, people are like, I didn't think you were going to respond. And I'm like, of course I'm going to respond because what you just sent me in my eyes was a cry for help. And I don't have this blog just to like passively read comments where people are very clearly in pain and want to hurt themselves. And so I think just even responding and acknowledging them is super important because as you mentioned, like just acknowledging people's hurt and experiences and what they're going through can be so powerful because people feel so alone and isolated. So number one, acknowledge. Number two, truly listen without judgment. I think that's really hard for a lot of people to do, but incredibly important because your life circumstances are not their life circumstances mm -hmm. and you can't judge them until you've walked in their shoes. Right. So, you know, really just listen without judgment and then also try to problem solve in a way that can be bite-sized. Like I try to say like, what type of debt do you have? How much debt do you have? Because for example, if they have federal student loans, get on income driven repayment, you can get your loans down to $0 monthly payments. If you're at the poverty level, you can get student loan forgiveness. Mm -hmm. um, while it's not something I necessarily recommend, certainly bankruptcy is better than dying by suicide. Yep. And I, obviously I tell people about the ramifications of that. And I say, talk to a professional. I'm not advising you do this, but it's an option. I think, you know, it's something that people should look into if they're literally suicidal over debt. Something I did early on with actually J money from budgets are sexy. We had this thing called debt drop where for like a year after I paid off my debt, we just did direct cash assistance to some of my readers who were suicidal. So 
I started with $100, but he said he would match. So we would send $200 cash payments to these people who would comment on my blog randomly. Obviously they weren't commenting because they knew they were going to get the money, but they would comment and I would send it to J money. And we'd be like, I think they're deserving of the cash assistance. And I have to tell you three, four, five years later, people email me. I don't know if you remember me, but you gave me $200 when I was at my lowest moment and I didn't trust anyone. I didn't have any hope. I didn't believe in anyone. And you really helped me out when I really needed it. And I'm back on my feet again. I'm life is still hard, but I've figured out better ways. And it's just like, you just realize how literally life changing 100 to $200 can be for someone who really needs it. And like no strings attached, you know, it's like, I didn't say you have to do this or you have to share like nothing. It was just take this money. I'm going to assume you're going to pay off debt. I'm not going to like tell you to send me screenshots. Like, I'm just going to trust that you do what you need to do with that money. And I've gotten so many great emails later on years later from people saying that it meant a lot to them. And that has just had a huge impact on me because it just goes to show that what we might think is, oh, that's not that much, or that's not going to make a difference. It absolutely can. And whether that's just words of encouragement, whether that's providing the right resources, I had another um, person that messaged me and they weren't clear about the difference between private loans and federal loans. And so I explained to them the difference and I explained to them the benefits of private loans. Like there's forgiveness options, there's deferment, and that has opened up a whole new world for them. And so sometimes people just don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So some people are literally at the surface, at the basics of like, I have all this debt. I literally don't know what to do. And just providing resources like hey, here's the difference between federal and private loans. Here's how bankruptcy would affect your credit. Um, Here are some direct cash assistance. Here's, you know, um, Aunt Bertha, which has a a site for finding resources. I think they recently rebranded to findhelp.org. But, you know, just being that person that can help connect them to resources or assistance. And I also say, you know, if people can afford it, therapy through Open Path Collective, like, Therapy has been a game changer for me. When I was really broke um, in Portland, I actually went to Portland State University. Their um, graduate counseling program had, you know, would-be therapists who were like one semester away from graduating who needed their clinic hours to graduate. Mm -hmm. And so it was like $15 a session. I was on food stamps. And so I negotiated it down to $5 a session. Um, I know with COVID, so many therapists and even counseling programs at schools are probably totally booked up, but it's still worth a try to see and get help. Um, I've been on medication on and off for half of my life. And when I've needed it, that's been a lifesaver too, just to kind of balance out the chemicals in my brain and just Mm -hmm. to make life a little easier and more survivable. And I think all of these things help. If you started 2022 with more debt than you'd like to have, you're not alone. Debt.com is here to help. Whether you still have holiday credit card debt to pay off or student loan payments are starting to build up again. Maybe you even have debt collectors that are hounding you for payments you just can't make. The experts at Debt.com can help. Finally, one website can help you solve your debt problems. Credit cards, back taxes, student loans, medical debt, collections, you name it, Debt.com can help you solve it. And they do it with no judgments. Because they understand that when people end up in debt, it's usually for things outside their control, like job loss or divorce or some other hardship. So if you're in debt, visit laurengrutman.com slash debt to get the relief you need. Or call 888 888- 431-2044 to get a free consultation with a debt relief specialist. Find solutions to get out of debt, fix your credit, and get on the path to achieving your financial goals. When life happens, visit debt.com. I'm a huge proponent and I talk about on the show that I'm in therapy and I think it's like the best thing on earth for me and how important it is just for my healing and, you know, just life in general, but that there's still so much shame and I think we're getting better, you know, but there's still a lot of shame attached to being in therapy. Right. But especially like 
I'm in therapy because of money. Like I, I just did an interview with a guy who does like money Reiki and money therapy, which I thought was so cool. Um, because there's so many reasons why we're, we have so much crap surrounding why we think about money the way that we do. But I think that feeling like you're not alone and that somebody understands, you know, where you're at, all of that is so crucial to feel that, that there's hope and to feel like that all you have to do is get started. And, and sometimes you know, working in this industry for so long, it's hard to give people that hope. It's like, we're on the other side of this now, right? Mm -hmm. So we've Mm -hmm. been through the debt journey. We've been through the repayment. We've been through the hard work. And, and sometimes we, I get people that come into my community, my courses that are in a ton of debt. And all they want to do is complain about the debt and they don't want to go get a side hustle. They just want to complain about it. And they want to, you know, somebody to win the lottery and give them money. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, yeah. and but yet they join the course because they want, they, they want something to hold on to and they want hope. Mm-hmm. So how is, as P as financial educators and, and even, you know, people that are just listening that might be in debt and have no hope left, how can we how can those people help themselves? Because I think I've been blessed with this go-getter attitude of just like, okay, I'm in debt. I got to figure it out. I'll do whatever it takes. But I understand that there's a lot of people that aren't like that, that there's a lot of people that are stuck. And they, if they don't find hope, they have a really hard time getting off of their butts to go do something. And mental health is a big piece of that. Like we said, it, it, it can feed. I mean, there's been many times in my life, like where I've been so depressed that I couldn't even get out of bed in the morning. So how do you go to a job? And, you know, especially if like, I have a family member of mine that has, that's bipolar. So sometimes that person can't like literally can't get out of bed for a while. So how, how can we help people and how can people help themselves to see that hope? Like, what can we do as a community through your podcast, through my podcast, through the financial community to help, help each other out that like, there's hope at the end of this. Yeah. So first of all, I think it's really important that people recognize that debt repayment is a process. And so what I mentioned in my book, dear debt is that I liken the process of debt repayment to the five stages of grief. The first one is denial. And I was completely in denial when I was paying off my debt. I synced all my loans to mint.com. I was trying to get my finances together. I saw that when I first graduated, even despite paying my undergrad loans for five years, I still had $68,000 left. And that number felt so overwhelming to me because like I borrowed in total 81,000, but I had paid 13,000 off, you know, for five years. But then I was like, oh my gosh, even though I've been paying, I still have 68,000. Two days later, I deleted my mint.com account (laughs) because I was like, I can't accept this. So that was denial. Then there's the anger. I was angry at my parents for not paying my, my school. I was angry at the government for even just offering me student loans. I was angry at other people. (laughs) I was angry at everybody, you know? And then it's like the bargaining, please. Can I just win the lottery? Can someone save me? Can I you know, marry a rich man, (laughs) like, you know, the the bargain. And and then the depression, the depression is just like, oh my gosh, no one's going to come save me. I really have to do this. And then finally acceptance. Mm. And you have to go through all of those stages. And like I said, so I spent all of 2012, a whole year crying, being anxious, being depressed, literally spinning my wheels until by the end of the year, I was just like, I literally can't go on like this. I felt like I hit my breaking point. And that's when I was like, if I just spend even a portion of the energy that I do crying and being upset on trying to be proactive and paying off debt and at least having a creative outlet to deal with these emotions that feel paralyzing to me, maybe I can have a chance. And so that's when I Googled well, how to pay off debt. That's when I discovered blogs, probably when I discovered you and Deacon from Well-Kept Wallet and Budgets Are Sexy. Like I discovered all of you guys. And that's when I was like, oh, maybe I should start my own blog because 
my debt is, you know, student loan debt and I don't have anything to sell. And, you know, mine is affecting my mental health and I want to talk about all these things. And so, first of all, acknowledge that it's a process, but you have to get sick of your own stuff. I think there's this beautiful Elizabeth Gilbert quote that I'm going to butcher, but the gist of it is that you have to be so sick of your own to finally make a change in your life. And you have to get to that point. And so for me, it was a year of crying, being depressed and being like, I'm sick of this. I can't go on like this. And so you have to realize that what got you into this situation will not get you out of this situation. So anything that you've done previously to try to get out, just throw it out the window. Yep. It didn't work. Yep. You have to do something completely different. And it's going to require you to get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. It's going to require you to shift your money mindset. And so this is really difficult because I would say a lot of the shifts are mental. Mm. So we all have beliefs that we hold on to and that we think are part of our identity that we've gotten from our friends, our family, our culture. So I thought, rich people were greedy. I thought everybody had student loans. I thought, you know, oh, student loans are the good debt. I realized all of these beliefs were holding me back from actually making money and actually caring about money and actually paying off my debt because those beliefs weren't conducive to actually paying off debt. And so I had to really think, where did these beliefs even come from? Mm -hmm. Why do I have them? And I had to let them go. And that feels like a, a shedding of your identity. And that can be incredibly painful because it's like a loss of self. Yeah. And that can be so hard for people, but it's necessary. And then also something that really helped me is, you know, I had $68,000 by the time I graduated from grad school after already paying for five years. And I realized even if I make four figure payments, like a thousand plus payments, that's going to be for years. It's not going to be like, Oh, I paid it off in six months or paid it off in a year. This is going to be years. And obviously if you're making those high of payments for years, you're going to get debt fatigue. You're going to get burnt out. And so what I did is a, I started having little milestones. So like I paid off a thousand, I'm going to go out for a like affordable lunch. I paid off 5,000. I'm going to go to the local massage school and get an affordable massage. $10,000. I'm going to take a day trip. And yeah, I know some people have mixed feelings about that, but that's what works for me is having reward systems. And then also what really helped is creating a debt free dream list. So obviously when I was paying off debt, I thought my life sucked. I hated it. I was working seven days a week. I was always working. I was sleep deprived. It was not fun. And it took a toll on my mental health, but I kept saying, what is my life going to look like? when I pay off debt, because that's the vision that I need to hold on to, to keep me going. Because once I get there, I'm never going to be back here again. And so I think it's important to note that I did not like living in Portland, Oregon. I thought it was too white, too quiet. Just not for me coming from LA and New York. I was like, this is like too quiet for me. And I don't like it here, but it was a lower cost of living. And so I made the conscious choice to stay in Portland while I was paying off debt. So number one on my debt-free dream list, I'm moving back to LA. Also, I really wanted cats, but I knew that having a pet would be additional money. So I was like putting cats on the list. And I also thought I've been to Europe. I've traveled. My mom has not. I would love to take her to Italy, but I know she won't go without me. So on my debt-free dream list, moving back to LA, getting cats, taking my mom to Italy. And I'm so happy to say that I have done all of those things within a year or two after paying off my debt. Like I live in LA now. Um, I took my mom to Italy six months after I paid off my debt. It was so beautiful and rewarding. I have two beautiful cats, Miles and Thelonious. And, you know, I'm living the life that I had dreamed of then. But because I was super clear about the vision I stayed motivated. And I think a lot of people lose momentum and lose motivation because they don't understand why it's important to pay off debt. Like no one will do anything if they don't have a reason why it's like, Oh, I don't care about my debt. Why should I pay it off? But if your reason is that you want to quit your job, if the reason is you want to travel the world, if your reason is you want to make sure your children have a better future you know, than you do, if your you know, reason is you want to take care of your mom and take her to Italy, like 
You need to be so specific about those reasons and let them inspire you and fuel you. So like I was tell, telling you earlier about the anger, you have to really key into what are the motivational triggers, whether it's an inspiring dream in the future or it's the anger, like what are the ways that you can motivate yourself to keep going? Because yeah, it's a bit of a, a hack. It is. And I always teach people through all of my, my programs that like you need to have that why so established in your goals and your vision that you, it's like laser focus, laser focus. This is my why. This is my why. One thing I wanted to go back to is that you were working right at this non for profit Mm -hmm. and you quit that job to go back to school, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you went and went back to work for the non-for-profit and then quit that job again to work on your blog. So it was a or different the writer, the, right? It was a different one. Yeah. Yeah. But so you've taken these chances a couple times mm-hmm. in quitting like regular jobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I love that because it breaks my heart to see people stuck in jobs that they hate and living a horrible life because they're stuck in fear of what if, right? And you did mention early on in the show that you said that you felt like you had messed up your life because you had quit this job, right? That you had made the biggest mistake of your life. You had made the biggest mistake of your life. You said that a couple of times. And now look at where you are now, right? And it's like, I truly believe that everything happens for a reason, whatever, whatever is meant to be, will be meant to be regardless of what. And I think that's just an important thing to, to, to make note of because what we sometimes think is like the biggest mistake or oops or horrible thing to happen to us often becomes such a great thing to turn and alter our life in a way that we never would have thought is possible. You would have never started the Dear Debt blog. You would have never written your book. You would have never helped all of these people and done the suicide, you know, blog stuff and given people money and done like all of the amazing work that you've done had you not quit that job and made like the biggest mistake of your life, you know? And that's what having grace on ourselves looks like and having self-care and self-love looks like. Same. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. A lot of people ask me, do you regret getting into student loan debt? And it's like, I don't know if I can answer that correctly or in the sense, like it led to this new career that I never thought was possible. And, you know, I had a friend tell me, Melanie, you turned your pain into your passion. And, you know, I do think about that. Like for a long time, I did think I ruined my life by quitting that job. And you know, I quit this other nonprofit job that I finally got after two years of waiting because I was going to take a bet on myself with self-employment. And that has been the best experience for me because, you know, a lot of people are worried about quitting their jobs. And I understand if you're making a cushy corporate salary that there's more to lose. But for me, actually, I was making $31,000 at that job. The most I ever made before was 38,000. And now, you know, I've made 60,000, I've made up to six figures and more. And it's like, I didn't even know that was possible. Like, so self-employment has gotten myself out of the low nonprofit pay trap. I have more work on my terms and it's opened up my financial life in ways I did not know was possible. And yeah, I had to go through all of that, like feeling like I made a mistake, figuring out self-employment and entrepreneurship, which is not easy, nope, but it's not. <laughs> you know, there are tests along the way, but mm-hmm. if you keep going, the rewards are infinite and you can just live a life that's better for your terms and better for your money as well. It is. And beyond your wildest dreams, you know, I get, I, I can take, I take summers off, you know, I don't work in the summer. I get to hang out with my kids. I mean, I, my life is beautiful, but it's, it's taken hard work, you know, but I just commend you for all the work that you're doing, because I do think that mental health 
and money are so intertwined. And I like how we started this podcast off with, and I don't remember what, what word you used, but about how they're, they go back. What is it? How they're bi-directional bi-directional. Yeah. Yes. They are so bi-directional because they both influence each other mm-hmm. and it can get you into a very, very fast downward spiral. And, um, one of the people that's coming up in the next couple of episodes is I have, um, actually a site, a doctor who focuses specifically on bipolar and he does all of his work on bipolar and overspending. So important. Yep. And, um, and so that is like a huge topic because I have, uh, somebody in my family who's bipolar. And that is another thing, like a lot of people that continuously, go into like huge spending sprees, like undiagnosed bipolar, you know, a lot of that is happening as well. So, I mean, there's just so much to unpack here. We could probably talk for hours on this topic, but, (laughs) um, so why don't you tell people like where they can find you now and how they can get involved with your work and on all of that? Yeah. Well, you can find me at deardebt.com as well as melanielockert.com and also check out Dear Debt, the book on Amazon and also the mental health and wealth show, wherever you find your podcasts. Awesome. Well, this has been so awesome to have you on and talk about it. And I, again, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing because it is such a powerful thing. And I think we, the more that we talk about these conversations, you know, and the more that people listen and say, okay, I'm not alone. Just like how they were commenting on your blog. Exactly. Say I'm not alone. There's hope and there's help. So for anybody listening today that is out there listening and feeling suicidal or feeling like they need help, um, reach out to one of us, reach out to somebody that, you know, and tell them, and just know that you're not alone and that, um, you're worth more than money, you know? Yes. Yes. And thank you for all the great work that you're doing with this. And I'm super excited for all the conversations that you're going to have and the life lives that you're changing. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. I just wanted to encourage you all that if you are feeling hopeless and suicidal about your debt situation, please call and get some help right now. There is hope for you. There's hope at the end of debt. Both me and Melanie were in a lot of debt and we both got out. So there is hope. Your life is way too precious. It's way too precious. So go and get help today. And if you listen to this episode and you're a financial professional that wants to be joining in on this conversation, I'd love to talk with you as well. I think me and Melanie both have a heart for mental health and, um, and money. So we'd love to join in, have you join in on the, on the conversation as well. You can find all the show notes for this episode at laurengroupman.com slash podcast. And I always say to leave a review if you want to. Um, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And again, I thank you all for supporting the Hard Money Talks show as always. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again for joining me on this episode and I'll see you next week. Bye.